Welcome to our discussion on unlocking the quantum economy. I am Juan de Pablo, Vice President for National Laboratories, Science Strategy, Innovation, and Global Initiatives at the University of Chicago. I am also the Lou Family Professor in Molecular Engineering and a Senior Scientist at Argonne National Laboratory. I am very much looking forward to the panel, which promises to be an exciting discussion with leaders in government, industry, and academia about how Chicago and the state of Illinois have positioned themselves to be the center of the quantum science and engineering world, in just the same way as Silicon Valley became the center of the semiconductor industry over 50 years ago. Today, we have an important announcement about a critical step on this path. Today, we are here to announce Duality, the first accelerator program in the nation that is exclusively dedicated to startup companies focused on quantum science and technology. The founding partners in this accelerator are here with us today. I'd like to acknowledge the University of Chicago Spolsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, the Chicago Quantum Exchange, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Argonne National Laboratory, and P33. On behalf of the University of Chicago, we thank you for your partnership and your hard work leading up to this day. The University of Chicago has been entrusted by the US Department of Energy with the stewardship of two national laboratories, Argonne and Fermilab, and I want to acknowledge this partnership. Another unique partner in our new quantum accelerator is Chicago Booth, one of the premier business schools in the world. Through these unique partnerships, we have an extraordinary opportunity to build on the strengths of our research, to develop talent in the underserved communities in the south side of Chicago, and to create development opportunities for this area of the city and for the entire region around Chicago. Along with our partners, we have been actively developing a blueprint for inclusive innovation in the context of quantum science and engineering as well as other emerging areas of technology. Through programs like the Duality Accelerator, we will create new companies, prepare our communities for the jobs that such companies will generate, and prepare a skilled workforce that capitalizes on rich opportunities for economic development. I would also like to acknowledge our speakers. We have Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, Paul Kearns of Argo National Laboratory, David Ashelum from the Chicago Quantum Exchange, Susan Martinez of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and James Hardiman of DCVC, and Ray Johnson at Bessemer Venture Partners. The distinguished company joining us today and sending video messages serves to highlight the public and private partnerships that are required to make accelerators like Duality a success and the potential that we all see in such an endeavor. Thank you all for joining us. And in the case of the mayor and the lieutenant governor, thank you for taking the time to send your video remarks. And of course, I would like to thank Governor Pritzker and Mayor Lori Lightfoot for their strong support of quantum engineering innovation overall. Here are Lieutenant Governor Strancho's video remarks, followed by Mayor Lightfoot's video remarks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, and, and today is an exciting day for Chicago and the state of Illinois. The launch of Duality, our first quantum accelerator, is a pivotal milestone in the mission to make Illinois a world leader in quantum technology. From the first self-sustained nuclear reaction to LEDs and the web browser, Illinois has a long history of serving as an incubator to significant technological advances. Duality, a first of its kind quantum accelerator in the United States, will carry on this proud tradition by providing a home for our nation's premier quantum startups and pioneering the commercialization of quantum technologies. We are in a ferocious global competition and no place is better equipped to win the quantum race than Illinois. Our federal government has recognized Illinois' immense talent 
and the tremendous capacity of our research institutions by investing more than $250 million to create three national centers here. And Governor Pritzker has committed an additional $200 million from Rebuild Illinois to firmly establish Illinois as a quantum hub. I commend the hard work and collaboration of the University of Chicago Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, the Chicago Quantum Exchange, and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, as well as P33. Their efforts will allow us to continue attracting the best and brightest from all over the world, helping to turn their innovative ideas into revolutionary breakthroughs for our society while bringing home long-term economic growth for years to come. Congratulations to all on this truly groundbreaking development. Hello everyone, I'm Mayor Lori Lightfoot and I'm here to help celebrate the launch of Duality, the first accelerator program in the nation that will be exclusively dedicated to advancing quantum science and technology focused startups. This launch builds on Chicago's long history and renowned reputation of being a hub for innovation and technology. And my own mission as mayor is to build the next generation of businesses and jobs right here in Chicago. With Duality, we will be able to further deepen our region's already robust ecosystem for technology development and commercialization, allowing us to grow up to 10 new quantum startups every year and become a leader in the global race to unlock the potential of quantum technology. Duality's wide-ranging impact will also be felt in all parts of the Chicagoland region thanks to a partnership between the University of Chicago and the University of Illinois, who are working together on a plan to ensure that quantum research and education will continue to serve as a catalyst for the Chicagoland region and especially our historically underserved Southside communities. Furthermore, this multi-million dollar initiative builds on our region's recent growth in the quantum science sector. In the last year alone, scientists from Argonne and University of Chicago launched a 52-mile quantum loop, one of the longest ground-based quantum communication channels in the entire country. Officials from the U.S. Department of Energy, um, or DOE, announced plans at University of Chicago to build a national quantum internet. And the DOE and the National Science Foundation announced that three of the eight federally funded quantum information science research centers and institutes would be based in the Chicago area. Now, with Duality, we will have even more opportunities to create jobs, develop our region's strengths, and ensure the future prosperity of our city for decades to come. So thank you, everyone, and please continue to be safe. I'm Paul Kearns, the director of Argonne National Laboratory. It is a pleasure to be part of today's announcement regarding duality. Uh, let me thank the Lieutenant Governor Stratton and Mayor Lightfoot for the remarks and their leadership and the growing partnership that they've established with Argonne National Laboratory. The governor and the mayor's office have played an important role in helping Argonne bring its science and technology to the city of Chicago to increase innovation and create opportunities in partnerships with many of the neighborhoods across greater Chicago land. We look forward to strengthening our partnership with this important quantum initiative. Argonne, together with our industry, laboratory, and university partners have positioned the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago to be the epicenter of this key industry of the future. With our history of pivotal discoveries, pioneering collaborations, and powerful facilities and scientific tools, we are advancing the frontiers of quantum information science and nurturing an R&D ecosystem in the Midwest that is robust and collaborative. Duality is the next chapter in this effort. It will provide entrepreneurs with support from leading quantum research, researchers, business mentors, and state-of-the-art research facilities and tools. Argonne will play a key role in supporting these entrepreneurs, leveraging our more than five years of experience working with innovators focused on science technologies through our lab-embedded entrepreneurship program we fondly call Chain Reaction Innovations. It is a proven model, and we look forward to extending it in support of the future entrepreneurs and startup companies joining Duality. 
We will also provide access to the powerful discovery capabilities of our national uh, scientific user facilities, including the Advanced Photon Source, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, and the Center for Nanoscale Materials. And with support from the Department of Energy's Office of Science, we are building additional research capabilities tailored to advancing quantum information science research. These include the quantum foundries uh, to provide a source of pristine materials for new quantum uh, devices through Argonne's QNEX Center and the Argonne University of Chicago Quantum Link, a metropolitan scale quantum communication test bed. We are excited to be a founding member of Duality and eager to partner with the entrepreneurs and their enterprises. Before I conclude, I would like to thank our host this afternoon, the University of Chicago, and uh, mention that President Zimmer and uh, Vice President DePablo are exceptional supporters of the National Laboratories. Thank you for the exciting opportunity to work together to unlock the quantum economy. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Oshalom. David is the Lou uh, family professor in Spintronics and Quantum Information and director of the Chicago Quantum Exchange. He's also director of Argonne's QNEX Center and the Quantum Information Science Group leader within Argonne's Material Science Division. David, please. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thank you everybody for being here this afternoon. As you just heard over the past decade, Chicago has really become one of the nation's leading centers for quantum science and technology with significant investments from our region's universities, national laboratories, the government, and industrial partners that are all now paying off. And as we just heard from the Lieutenant Governor and from the mayor, just last summer, the US Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation awarded three of the eight national quantum centers right here in Illinois to Argonne National Lab, Fermilab, and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It couldn't come at a better time. To drive the quantum revolution that will pave the way for truly radical improvements in technology with impacts across a range of industries from finance to national security and medicine, research alone is simply not enough. Research and industry need to work together and they need to work together to develop the hardware, the software, and the enabling technologies for quantum communications, computing, and quantum sensing. To this end, the Chicago Quantum Exchange integrates the expertise of researchers with almost two dozen companies to develop and scale up these technologies, work that will be amplified with the launch of the Duality Quantum Accelerator. Now, duality is really the key ingredient to drive discoveries to practical technologies and the marketplace. Startups will be integrated with our region's quantum scientists and engineers who develop these new technologies each day with the Chicago Quantum Exchange corporate partners and the many skilled students and trainees coming out of our institutions. We'll work to create a diverse and inclusive workforce by providing more opportunities for students to develop really the in-demand skills and the connections to startups more so than offered by conventional academic environments. Duality is only possible today because of the collective technical expertise of our institutions, paired with a genuine vision to support future quantum industries and a collaborative partnership between the University of Chicago's Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, the Chicago Quantum Exchange, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Argonne National Lab, and P33. The quantum ecosystem here in Illinois will have an amplifying effect on emerging technology companies that join Duality. And all of us look forward to working together and growing our nation's quantum economy. So now it's actually my great pleasure to introduce Susan Martinez, the Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Martinez. Unfortunately, Susan is having a little bit of Zoom trouble. Um, but uh, thank you, David. We at the University of Illinois are delighted to be a part of this game-changing announcement. Uh, my name is Andy Singer, and I work in the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation as a faculty fellow for Innovation and Entrepreneurship Research Strategies. Uh, it's clear that the emerging quantum ecosystem and market for quantum discovery will be transformational. While the accelerator will be located in Chicago, we know that our efforts will have an impact across the state and around the globe. The University of Illinois has a long and storied history of innovation in the engineering and scientific disciplines that, uh, that underpin the advances that shape modern society. We also have a track record of bringing that technology to the marketplace. 
As one of the first sites in the National Science Foundation's Innovation Core and partner in the Midwest Innovation Core node, the university has helped to transition hundreds of technologies developed under federally funded research into commercial use. As the home of the National Science Foundation's $25 million Quantum Leap Challenge Institute for Hybrid Quantum Architectures and Networks, our teams are working to unlock both the technological and economic potential of quantum computing. We spent most of the last several years working with our partners across the region to develop deep connections and collaborations, and it's wonderful to see those opportunities taking shape. Now it's my pleasure to introduce James Hardiman, a partner with DCVC, who has a pre-recorded message for us. My name is James, and I'm a partner at DCBC. DCBC is a $2.5 billion venture capital firm that focuses on investing in deep tech companies. And for me, a deep tech company is a company that is built on some kind of scientific or engineering innovation. Now, I would include nearly every quantum technology company in that definition. Now, unsurprisingly, we've been an active investor in many quantum technology companies. And that would include quantum computing companies like Rigetti and Atom Computing, as well as quantum software and sensing companies like QControl. As an investor in this space, one thing that I've noticed is that it can be very difficult to start a quantum technology company. It's a relatively specialized field, and the capital costs to just get started are very high. Even if you do get started, it can be difficult for potential partners and financiers to tell the companies apart because they just don't have the expertise to do so. These are exactly the kinds of problems that an accelerator can help address. Accelerators can one, lower the barriers to entry by providing access to expensive facilities, two, reduce friction to partnering and capital raising, and three, help augment founders' technical or business knowledge as needed. All of these translate to higher probabilities of success. So as an active investor in quantum technology companies and a UChicago alum, I'm excited that the University of Chicago and the Chicago Quantum Exchange are spearheading this quantum accelerator. Uh, James, thank you for that presentation, uh, and thank you all for inviting me to attend the event, and welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm an operating partner with Bessemer Venture Partners, and I wanted to give you a little more of my background in quantum computing. Bessemer has been following quantum computing for five or six years, and we have made uh, an investment in Brigetti a year and a half or so ago. My personal background in quantum computing began in 2011. Uh, while at Lockheed Martin, I purchased the first commercially available quantum computer called D-Wave 1, which uh, has been upgraded a number of times and still uh, resides at, at USC. In 2014, I gave a $5 million grant to the University of Maryland starting the Quantum Center, which became IonQ. And uh, you know that that company is, is in a SPAC process and will become the first pure play public quantum computer, quantum computing company. And I'm currently on the board of Rigetti Computing, uh, as I said, in which Bessemer is an investor. So when, when I think about Chicago, a lot of people like to compare their area with um, Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley, it, we think, has kind of solved the problem of getting through the valley of death. I think DARPA was credited with coming up with that term the first time. How do you get new ideas, new innovations, in this case, in the DARPA case, out to the warfighter. In our case, how do you get it commercialized? And so we looked at some of the elements of success that are that happened in Silicon Valley, and then let's compare those to Chicago. First one, large concentration of talent. Of course, with the national laboratories and universities, that's a, that's a check. A good cooperation and close proximity among these ecosystem elements. That's obviously true with the Chicago Quantum Exchange and other such entities. Extensive professional networks among the elements, cultural diversity, a melting pot to inspire innovation, and then in the case of California, no non-competes to reduce conflicts and stagnation. And I think that's probably okay in the Chicago area. Uh, some of the processes for success 
the ability to integrate innovation strategy with business strategy to beat the valley of death. And I think that's going to be, other speakers have talked about it, it's going to be really important, is that there needs to be, especially in a startup, early stage startup, it's a focus on technology, but you always have to co-develop that business strategy because they work hand in hand together. And with a focus on customer needs, not just tech driven. And so when I think about <clears throat> P33 and the role of the incubators, they provide a jumpstart to many of the elements of success that I just talked about. Duality has the right program elements. They have the they have training elements, P33, they have facilities, they have mentoring and a little bit of money. And so I wish uh, the organization nothing but success and I look forward to working with you and following uh, your progress as you go forward. With that, we'll turn this back over to Juan. Thank you very much, uh, Ray, for your very interesting remarks. And thank you all, all of our distinguished speakers on this historic day as we launch Duality. We are fortunate to have the support of the mayor, the lieutenant governor, and our partners in our quantum science and technology efforts over the years. And thank you to everyone who tuned in to watch the announcement. We really hope that you will stay for an exciting panel discussion, unlocking the quantum economy. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this panel, Megan Clifford of Argonne National Laboratory. Megan. Thank you, Juan, and thank you to all the speakers and a warm welcome to our audience on Zoom and YouTube. It's an honor to host this panel and I'm looking forward to talking with our panelists about how the Chicago area and the greater region are positioned to unlock the quantum economy. At Argonne, I'm the Associate Laboratory Director for Science and Technology Partnerships and Outreach and have seen firsthand the potential of the quantum economy. What do we mean by unlocking the quantum economy? Well, there are critical elements, elements that are right here in the Chicago region that are necessary to develop quantum technologies and move them to the marketplace. The six major elements that we believe are critical to unlocking the quantum economy are in-depth and accessible scientific expertise, substantial public-private partnerships and investment, a diverse, educated, and skilled quantum workforce and manufacturing expertise, an integrated supply chain, tech transfer and commercialization capabilities, and visionary capital. I'd like to start by just asking each of our panelists today to introduce themselves, tell us who they are and what they do, and just briefly why their area of expertise is important to unlocking the quantum economy. And let's go ahead and start with Michael Brett. Michael, please. Thanks very much, Megan, uh, and hi, everybody. Uh, Congratulations to everyone involved in this initiative. Uh, the team at Amazon Web Services is thrilled to be a part of this and uh, we look forward to the, the success of this program. So my name is Michael Brett. I'm a principal specialist for Amazon Bracket, which is the quantum computing service offered by uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, that product went into general availability in August last year. And so we've been offering uh, a variety of compute services uh, through Bracket to all of our customers globally. And so you know, across the six major components of the quantum economy, um, for us, it's about an integrated supply chain and enabling uh, businesses to build on bracket and deliver to, to their customers. So I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, and next, Vanessa Chan, please. Hi, I'm Vanessa Chan. I'm the Chief Commercialization Officer and the Director of the Office of Technology Transitions at the Department of Energy. And uh, I just wanna echo the thoughts and congratulations on launching this really important accelerator. Uh, I've spent the last 25 years at the intersection of technology and business. I have a PhD from MIT in material science and engineering and was a partner at McKinsey and Company where I co-led their innovation practice, helping companies that are spending billions of dollars in R&D try to figure out how to bring it to the market. And so now I'm 12 weeks into my new role as a Biden appointee uh, uh, in the Department of Energy. And I'm very excited because uh, my role as the Chief Commercialization Officer is to ensure that all the R&D work that is being done in our national labs, Argonne included, are making it to the real world so that it can have an impact. And so I'm thrilled to be a part of the launch of this accelerator because I think it's a really important part of the economy. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, next, Dan Caruso, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Absolutely, <clears throat> and congratulations. Uh, I'm a Chicago native, a University of Illinois engineering grad and a University of Chicago MBA, and I've been involved in the Polsky Center. 
I'm also a, a serial entrepreneur. I was part of three startups, all of which had exits for north of $10 billion, and they were all in the fiber optics and bandwidth space. The first one starting in Chicago, originally named Chicago Fiber Optics, the last two brought me out to Boulder, level three, and, the com- and then the company I started, which was Zale Group. But quantum's been a passion of mine for the last uh, 20 years, and I'm excited to now be directly part of the quantum world. I'm, uh, I'm executive chairman and the interim CEO of Cold Quantum, one of the most interesting quantum companies out there, uh, developing uh, applications that extend all the way from quantum computing to many different quantum sensing applications uh, with about a, uh, getting pretty close to 100 people, most of which are scientists and engineers that are deeply immersed in the quantum world. So I'm thrilled to see uh, Chicago playing such a prominent role and my alma mater's uh, being right smack in the middle of it. So excited to participate in this panel. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, next, Justin Ging. Justin, please. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Ging. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Honeywell Quantum Solutions. It's a pleasure to be part of the announcement today. Uh, I lead our efforts to bring the very high performance quantum compute hardware to market. Uh, at Honeywell, we're working very hard to realize this vision that quantum promises for these world changing applications. And, you know, I think, you know, of those components, we just see ourselves as part of the value chain, somewhat as an integrator of components, a lot of the pieces that feed into our hardware systems, but also a supplier uh, of tools, the best tools that possible to develop these algorithms and move quantum forward. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Next, we have Brad Henderson here with us today. Brad, please. Great. Thanks, Megan. I really appreciate it. And uh, a huge thank you to all the partners that made today happen. Uh, it's been a real team effort and a proud day for our region. Uh, so my name is Brad Henderson. I'm the CEO of P33. We're a business and civic-led initiative uh, in our region, really focused on making sure um, our region is prepared for the innovation economy uh, and, and the new economy. And core to that work is a belief that we have one of the best science complexes in the world. Uh, so much to be proud of, so many collaborative, impressive institutions. The real question is, how do we turn that into a science economy? Uh, and how do we all come together to make that happen? And so that's a big part of our, our work at P33 and what we hope to do with all the partners today. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is core to that is doing it in a more inclusive way. Uh, and so if you think about the, the quantum workforce of the future, I think one of the challenges for all of us is to make sure that that workforce looks like all of Chicago, all of our state, all of our country. And so that's another thing that all of our partners are working on as part of this effort. So thanks again. Wonderful, thank you, Brad. Uh, next on our panel is Jay Schrankler. Jay, please. Thank you, Megan. And again, uh, as Brad said, thank you to all the panelists for joining us today. I'm Jay Schrankler. I lead the Polsky Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship based at the University of Chicago. Our roots are 25 years old, uh, based in the Booth School of Business, one of the top business schools in the country and the world at the University of Chicago. And we won, we run one of the largest uh, and most successful uh, based collegiate accelerators in the country called the New Venture Challenge. Um, we've been applying that to technologies for the last 25 years, startup companies, et cetera. And we're very honored to be the operator of the Duality Quantum Accelerator going forward. And uh, we look forward to the challenge of that and see tremendous opportunity going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And our last panelist is Andy Singer, but we heard from Andy earlier. Thank you, Andy. And he actually would love to uh, give his time to Susan, who was able to, to get on. So I'm going to just turn it over to Susan for a couple words before we get started with the panel. Susan, please. Uh, thank you, Megan. Um, I seem to be caught in a little purgatory nightmare here, and I don't have active video, but let me just say a couple words to say how excited I am about this collaboration across Chicago, across the state of Illinois. This reminds me of the days of starting up places like Kendall Square and, uh, and uh, uh, Mission Bay and Silicon Valley. I can't wait to see what the outcome is after we bring together the great minds from Argonne University of Chicago, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, our thriving um, Chicago participants and to create this area in quantum that's gonna not only um, drive uh, uh, more student training, uh, more advanced training, 
but also economic vitality across the region that's going to be incredibly impactful to our state and our nation and beyond. I'll stop there and just want to reaffirm our commitment from the University of Illinois and how excited we are. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in with the panel. Um, I will share that for those of you in the audience, you should see um, here soon, hopefully, a Q&A feature showing up where you can submit questions. If we have time um, at the end of the panel, we'll try to get to the audience's questions. Um, so I'd like to start off with a question about really today's exciting announcement and why an accelerator uh, like duality is really important to the economy. And I'd like to ask Vanessa for her thoughts first on that question. Sure, so we talked a little bit already about the value of depth and accelerators are really critical to help move research from the lab to the marketplace. Without them, lab really would not have any impact in the real world because you can't get the collisions, pun intended, between startups, government, university capabilities, national labs, and big companies. So an accelerator like this can really bring the key ecosystem together. And the implications of quantum information science on our economy and nation could be transformational. We are already seeing significant commercial interests arising from the promise of quantum technologies to provide perfectly secure communications, novel solutions to highly complex optimization problems in finance and healthcare, more accurate measurements of physical phenomena, and far more realistic simulations of the real world. And so the Chicagoland region is really poised to support startups developing quantum technology, in particular by leveraging a really strong quantum ecosystem with world-class researchers, researchers and really a diverse industry base. So I think it's wonderful that Duality is being launched here. I, go, I agree, Vanessa. And uh, Jay, did you, would you like to add to that? Thanks, Vanessa. Just a couple of quick comments. Um, Vanessa mentioned the valley of death. I like to think of there's uh, either parallel or serial valleys of death, if you were to think about it. We have technology valleys of death, but I think there can also be business valleys of death. So we know that startups can require both resources, and, and that's what duality is here to uh, enable, bring both technology and business expertise. Let me focus on the latter, why this is so important. We know that um, through our experience at the Chicago uh, Booth School of Business, as well as the Polsky Center on what it takes for these businesses to cross that valley of death. As I mentioned earlier in remarks, 25 years of the New Venture Challenge. And now we've added to our uh, repertoire by having such terrific partners and why this is, uh, is so important in Chicago is we have not only Argonne, but we have the Chicago Quantum Exchange, the University of Illinois, P33, and just a set of really great partners uh, to do what we uh, do well already, and we need that. So I think there's the opportunities terrific for this here. Thanks, Jay. And Dan, do you have any additional thoughts you'd like to share? Absolutely. I'm a big believer in uh, having tech accelerators. Tech Stars is in my backyard. I've been part of the University of Chicago Accelerator for a number of years. And the ability to uh, help those companies that are forming, beginning to scale up, give them the support, the tools, and the, and the financial resources to help them turn kind of their ideas into real businesses that create and sustain jobs and keep our economy at the cutting edge. So I'm, I think it's great what we're doing here. Thanks, Dan. And so I've heard the, the conversation around, you know, the valley of death, and we know having in-depth science expertise is important. But how can an accelerator like Duality really help move the quantum technologies from lab to market? And to kick us off, I'll ask Justin to, to chime in here. Yeah, I think uh, uh, among the many uh, resources that the accelerator provides, a few stand out to me as being key contributions. And I think one of those is really raising the business acumen of the team, uh, of, of a startup team. The, the ability to articulate their value proposition or their technology. The technology might be fantastic, world change, but unless they can communicate that, it becomes difficult to really build that pipeline and, and, and then take the, the voice of the customer and adapt that messaging. Uh, and the second thing that stands out to me is helping on prioritization. Uh, there's a lot of things to prove out in the early days, both proving the technology and proving some of the business uh, areas, proving that there are people willing to pay money for 
the uh, the technology and and developing that messaging. Great, thanks, Justin and Andy. Would you like to add? Sure. You know, an accelerator um, gathering experienced innovators and entrepreneurs uh, with a focus on bringing deep technology and and a deep tech accelerator is really focused on technologies that are based on fundamental research in science and technology, bringing that to the market, many of the challenges that are associated with that and, and unique to deep tech entrepreneurship uh, can be mitigated. Deep tech entrepreneurship is different. Um, not only are the challenges in, in the nature of the innovations themselves, but due to the complexity of the systems, the path to the marketplace is often very different than a typical startup. So as a result, you know, bringing together a critical mass of experienced entrepreneurs who can provide guidance and support through this process is a tremendous advantage for those who can participate in this accelerator. And ideally, they're so successful in this ecosystem that they choose to stay in the region and build and grow right here in Chicago. Thank you, Andy. And to your point about bringing together a critical mass, partnerships are really instrumental to that. And so, I wanted to ask Brad Henderson his thoughts on how private uh, public partnerships and investment really play a key role in these efforts. Brad, please. Yeah, one of the interesting things you hear when you talk to deep tech investors is typically a rule of thumb around for every dollar of equity, I need five to $10 of, of uh, additional dollars that don't come from the venture fund. What does that mean? That means solving these businesses requires a ton of partnership with the federal government the state government, local government, Argonne National Labs, foundations, et cetera. So you, you may have a great idea and you may have gotten venture funding, but you're gonna need a lot of public partnership to get there. Uh, but that's not enough either. And, and this notion of getting really good market access and customer validation as part of your process is essential to building a deep tech ecosystem. And that's one of the parts I get most excited about our region. So if you think about Chicagoland, it's a trillion dollars in corporate revenue. And I look at that trillion dollars and I think, think about how many applications exist out there we could start on today related to quantum technology. And, and, and Megan, we've been together as part of a journey, particularly in financial services as a team to say, when you've got the likes of Northern Trust and Allstate and Citadel and TransUnion, et cetera, all of whom are Capital One Discover chomping at the bit to say, let us try, let us experiment, let us work with our uh, tech friends and our in academia and the labs and our venture partners to see if this works. And so to me, that's where I get really excited is how do we come together uh, and put these pieces together uh, regionally in a way we haven't before. That's excellent. Thank you, Brad. And Michael, any other thoughts to share on this question? Yeah, so with quantum technologies, we are still in the earliest, earliest stages of this technology and bringing it to commercialization. And there are so many scientific uh, challenges yet to be overcome. Uh, and I really like the approach that uh, the, the, the government has taken with the National Quantum Initiative and the work that the Department of Energy is leading through the, the, quantum, the, the, the quantum centers uh, around the nation to really drive the, the scientific agenda of what's needed to bring uh, quantum technologies into um, uh, commercial reality. And so the partnerships that we can establish between universities, the national labs, uh, enterprises like Amazon uh, and the startup community it's so critical for getting the, the science work coming out of those labs and, and universities to transition into innovation and then uh, commercial adoption. Uh, so we're at the, the very earliest stages of that. It's so critical that we get that pathway right and the, the relationships between all those institutions established. Perfect. Any other thoughts from the panel before I move on to my next question? Okay. So um, this is really about the workforce. And um, you know, I love that Brad Henderson brought up really the importance of inclusivity uh, in his introduction. And so how can a diverse, educated and skilled quantum workforce be a point of differentiation for duality and for the greater region and really thinking about inclusive innovation? Um, I'd like to ask Jay to comment first on this. Jay, please. Sure, thanks, Megan. Um, one of the things that I, I think is really interesting, if you look across the US, you can find these centers where certain industries or technologies took off. And uh, I mean, one example, I was in Minneapolis before here, which is now a hub of medical device activity, and how did that happen? 
Well, it really does require not only strong universities, public private partnerships, but at the really heart of this is a great workforce that's skilled and trained. And I think you can look at diversity in many dimensions. And uh, we know we're more successful by having a more diverse workforce. And that's been pretty much proven across the board. And if you look at it, um, you want to have this diverse workforce, workforce both built inside your ecosystem and attract that workforce from outside the ecosystem as well. So you have really that diverse mix from everywhere that you get. And, and that's one of our objectives. And if you look at what an accelerator can provide is actually opportunities for experiential learning as well. And we know that from our experience in our other accelerator activity. So as students and uh, researchers are coming through uh, trying to start their company, it does provide opportunities for other students to uh, participate and learn experientially as well. Thank you, Jay. Andy, other thoughts to share, please. Sure. Uh, I agree with Jay. Um, you know, deep tech in general and, and quantum tech startups in particular are going to need a unique blend of science, engineering, business talent that really all understand the potential opportunities ahead. Um, and the, the ecosystem that we've put together here in the Midwest is diverse along many axes. Uh, and, and Chicago really, truly is unique. And I'm not just saying that because I was born and raised in the Chicago suburbs. Um, and, and have, have uh, started two technology startups um, out of the University of Illinois in this region. It really truly has a lot to offer that is vastly different than what you'll find in any other uh, startup ecosystem. So, you know, building on a strong foundation of talent in the region, skilled in quantum science and related technologies can provide a real advantage to the companies that are in this ecosystem. I think Chicago is a great place for the start. Great, thanks, Andy. And I'm going to open it up in a second here for the rest of the panel to see if there's any other comments on this important topic. But I, I just wanted to make a comment myself um, that, you know, I'm just so proud that in the design of duality, diversity, equity, and inclusion was thought about up front. Um, and that team really spent, we've all spent a lot of time on that. So more to come, but you know, that's a really important factor. Any other, any other comments from the panelists on this topic before I shift gears? I don't want to say something, Megan, you know, I'm currently actually on, uh, on a leave of absence from the University of Pennsylvania, where I'm a professor of engineering there, and also was an angel investor, where I helped a lot of my students start companies who also went through accelerators. And so I think you here uh, uh, with this accelerator have the perfect, uh, vehicle from which to have the Chicago students stay in Chicago to do things, right? And so if there's a way that you know you have University of Chicago students working on startups, which are then be accelerated, that's a way to also help build out the workforce. And so I think this is a perfect pairing, right? Where you've got a, a university as part of this accelerator so that it will be a catalyst for workforce growth. Yeah, great point. Thanks, Vanessa. Okay, I'm gonna take us from people to supply chain. And my question is, um, I'm going to tee this up for Justin. The question is, could you please just describe to us the importance of having an integrated supply chain? Yeah, so in these early days of quantum, our developers could not just go out and buy the pieces they need and put them together. Uh, they had to take things that were on the shelf, but then modify them and adapt them to, to make these quantum systems. And it took a dedicated effort of our team to go out and, and work with suppliers and educate them and actually pull them into the quantum community and say, I know you didn't design this part for quantum, but this is how we're using it. These are the things that we're doing with your systems. And wouldn't it be great if you could actually tweak these to do what we really needed to do? And as it turns out, help everyone else in the quantum community as well. And so we've seen that it's very important to kind of pull in these tight relationships with the suppliers and vendors and that leads to the optimization of the product efficiencies across the spectrum and really kind of the focus development that helps everyone in the community. Thanks, Justin. And Michael, what are your thoughts on the topic of supply chain? Yeah, so I'll take a slightly different tack on this because um, at AWS, our, our customers are using uh, our compute resources, but what they're building on top of that is, is a software stack. Uh, which then delivers value to their, their customers. Uh, and the integrated nature of the software stack in quantum computing is, is so critical. 
And uh, what we're seeing is a, a great community that's um, branching out into different tools that are becoming available. So we've got, for example, the Penny Lane Machine Learning Library, uh, which is getting a lot of attention to uh, help uh, developers who understand machine learning then pick up some of the tools that allow them to do quantum machine learning uh, on that stack. And uh, one of the other critical pieces of this uh, integrated nature of the work is uh, you really need to understand how the computer itself is solving the problem to write good software on there. So there's a deep understanding of the, uh, the physical performance of a quantum computer that enables you to get the best possible performance out of the software that's written there. And so we're seeing a lot of um, investment from uh, many different folks across the community into building out abstraction layers for quantum computing software that help developers uh, get the best possible performance out of, out of the hardware that we make available. So we're really excited to see that continue. And we think there's a, a huge opportunity for companies in the Chicago ecosystem to take advantage of that too. It's exciting. Thank you, Michael. Um, before I ask my next, next question to the panelists, I just wanted to let the audience know that the Q&A feature is not appearing if you're looking for it. Um, don't feel like you can't find it. It's not actually there. Um, so please go ahead and we're going to use the chat function. I ask that you, when you pull up the chat, that you send it to all panelists instead of all attendees. Um, and we'll go ahead and, and use that. And hopefully we have some time for a couple of those audience questions at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna move along to tech transfer and commercialization. Was somebody trying to jump in there? Yeah, Megan, if, if I could jump in on the last question oh, um, real quickly. Thanks. So uh, if you're designing uh, quantum software, you need a quantum computer, but what if you're designing quantum sensing systems? What do you need there? Uh, that's a different question. Uh, and uh, one thing that we've been experimenting with is a quantum matter machine that is a design tool for those who are building the full range of sensing applications. And I think that's another example of how the industry can work with an accelerator to bring those types of enabling tools to them early on so that they can, they can focus on developing a range of applications, whether they be software based or sensing based using the tools that are available uh, to them. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate you jumping in there. Would anyone else like to add on this topic before I move on? Okay. Um, Jay, I'd like to ask you to start us off on uh, the question is, how will deep knowledge of tech transfer and commercialization be critical to this effort? Please, Jay. Sure, and, and Dan, thanks for that setup because I'm gonna use the tools in this explanation because you're right, it is, is absolutely critical here. And I'll get to that in a second. But I think we should really view this as overall knowledge transfer as we bring things to lab, lab to market. It's not just about people signing license agreements or doing commercialization deals. We're talking about a whole system of acceleration and transition from lab to market that in, in embodies all knowledge, whether it's business or technology. So we got across this valley of death. We've heard that talked about before. To do that, especially in the era of quantum, there's gonna have to be a lot of trial and error. And you gotta be able to iterate on that really fast. And not only do you have to iterate on it fast, but the more you can have the right tools as Dan referred to for different applications, that's gonna help you get there faster. And I think that's really paramount here. And that goes to facilities, whether it's Argonne National Labs, the universities, tools as Dan has described, and experts, which you all pull these things together in an accelerator like duality. Thanks, Jay. And uh, I'm going to also call on Vanessa knowing, you know, in her role as DOE's chief commercialization officer, I, I imagine you've got some thoughts on this question on tech transfer and commercialization, Vanessa. So please go ahead. Hopefully I do. Otherwise, I have an issue with the role I have. Uh, but, um, you know, overall, I think tech commercialization is really uh, important to think about early on. I think as researchers, oftentimes we can get focused on the hard technology milestone that we have to solve and not think about the system or the ecosystem that's actually playing into. And so I think those of us who are deep in tech commercialization know 
it's the technology milestones plus. Like if you just get over the technology, nothing about the ecosystem, the infrastructure, the system that's actually being put into, you actually will not be able to bring things to market. And so um, those of us you know, who are deep here really want to ensure that the market is coming in early with thoughts, that the private companies that can be helping to commercialize things are bringing their thinking to the table as well to really help these startups start to shape the technology they're working on so it can be a, a plug and play approach. And uh, it'll be iterative, right? As Jay mentioned, uh, none of this uh, sausage making is ever very uh, easy or clean. And we really need a comprehensive kind of soup to nuts approach that not only puts lab quantum research on a consistent path towards the marketplace, but also brings other government agencies to the table, municipalities and state governments, and of course, incubators, startups, and the big companies. So we can build an ecosystem that keeps these commercialization pathways clear while giving innovators the freedom to envision every application for their work and to iterate right together. And I think this uh, is a hybrid approach is really, really important. And that's how we can really ensure that we're setting the stage for the US to have technological leadership in quantum, which will have huge implications uh, to our nation's competitiveness. Fantastic, thank you, Vanessa. Any other thoughts from the panel around tech transfer and commercialization? I'd just like to say that, that echoing what, what Vanessa said, you know, when people think about startups and accelerators, they tend to think about iPhone apps and, and software startups that, you know, are overnight successes. And anything that's done in quantum is, you know, an overnight success that was 20 years or 30 years or 50 years in the making. Technology commercialization and tech transfer, in particular deep tech transfer, um, really requires an ecosystem. And the kind of activities that we're putting together with this accelerator really are going to be critical to creating that ecosystem, you know, not only for the supply chains, but also the supply chains in terms of talent, getting the talent pool to be ready to, you know, to participate in this ecosystem as it evolves. So I think it's a really exciting time and it's an exciting time to, to rethink you know, what deep tech commercialization and deep tech transfer are. And I agree with Vanessa, it's critical to the economy and the technical advantages that we have as a, as a nation. Yeah, thanks, Andy. It does take an ecosystem and we're so lucky we're here in the Chicagoland region with that ecosystem and all the elements in it already. So we are all anxious, right, for products to be launched from these quantum companies. So I want to ask Dan, how soon could we see you know, some products coming out. What, what, what are your thoughts there, Dan? Yeah, it's going to be a journey, but there's already uh, early signs. We already ship products. We're going to do over uh, over 10 million this year with a portion of that being kind of components that are used by others in their quantum systems. But what we see as big product categories outside of quantum computing, and we do see quantum computing as being big, but outside of quantum computing, we see a set of products that will culminate in things like quantum positioning systems as being very uh, key or quantum RF is a category that's gonna be gigantic in of itself. And these are areas that are less talked about than quantum computing or maybe quantum communication, but they're every bit as impactful, uh, will change society in vast ways. Like I think for one example, autonomous vehicles are probably never truly gonna be autonomous until quantum is a big part of the vehicles themselves, both on the RF side and on the, uh, on the QPS side. So there's going to be all kinds of quantum innovation that go way beyond what we talk about with quantum computing. Thank you, Dan. And Michael, please uh, would be interested in your thoughts as well on this question. Yeah, we're, we're in a very early stage for making quantum computers uh, commercially available for companies to um, build their solutions. Um, but we're already starting to see um, some releases of software. So just in the last couple of months, we've seen uh, Q Code, based in the Netherlands, launch a, a product that does uh, chemical simulation that's been built on Bracket. Uh, QCWare, based in Silicon Valley, uh, making developer tools available uh, through their platform called Forge. Uh, and one of our partners, Strangeworks, has also uh, put together a developer platform that integrates uh, into Bracket. So we're, we're starting to see the early stages of the, like the first uh, commercially available products that are built on a, a cloud environment that incorporates quantum, classical, different forms of compute uh, that, that then go directly to the end customers. Um, but the principal use case right now for quantum computing is science. Like we need really good science to come out of uh, the national labs, the universities and, and startups and, and enterprises to help drive the overall uh, ecosystem forward and, and answer some of those uh, most challenging questions. 
So we uh, at AWS, we're making available a, a significant amount of uh, uh, compute available just to research scientists uh, to answer questions around algorithms and application design, which can then feed into the innovation pipeline. Thank you, Michael. I couldn't agree more. It starts with the science. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears and talk about money. Um, I'm gonna call on Brad. Brad loves talking about money. So how do you think, Brad, the investors are gonna react? You know, we, we talk about visionary capital being needed. So please share your thoughts on uh, investors. It clearly in the grand scheme of venture investing right now, quantum is, is a, a modest amount, right? That's gonna grow every year for, you know, as, as far as we can imagine. Um, but I, I do think it's important to distinguish a very mature product in a venture market where it's every nickel matters, the framework for the industry is uh, defined, there's a very structured process on how capital gets deployed, et cetera, and what we're talking about here. To me, uh, the investor network and a lot of what we're gonna be talking about for the next couple of years is it's still really about learning, it's about collaboration, it's about curiosity because we're still figuring so much out. It's actually many of the conversations that will add as much value as the capital deployed. Uh, and so I think that's what's so exciting about this accelerator. That's what is so exciting to me about bringing together Urbana and Argonne and New Chicago and Polsky, et cetera, um, is if I'm a, a it, 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 the, it's the random collision conversations, Megan, we've even seen in some of the round tables we've had before where you, to me, the really interesting question is when somebody who's new to the space says to a scientist, slow down, let me make sure I understand this. Uh, and that discovery process that people have from one another as they learn and try to figure out what it all means, that's what I think investing is right, about right now. It's about setting the terms and the engagement and the dialogue between scientists, business people, and investors. We're going to be at that for a while now, and, and this accelerator helps speed that up. Terrific. And Justin, I'm interested in your thoughts as well on this topic, please. Yeah, we. I think we all recognize quantum is, is a marathon and we're in the early days. We have a long way to go to recognize the full potential of quantum. Um, and you know, uh, to your last question about products being released, we released two systems commercially last year. We have customers actively using these to develop algorithms. But I think what everyone's really waiting for is this future that we're going to build together about some of these mega value applications, these world changing types of things. And I think that future vision is so compelling and so game changing that it, it's brought in and it will continue to bring in a variety of investment. Uh, and one type of investor that uh, we think is very important is actually the future customers themselves. So some of these enterprise customers who are going to use quantum to change their businesses to be these kinds of differentiating capabilities. And, and they're active now in supporting and working with startups. Um, and we've been in collaborations with them to, to sponsor research right now and actively participate in. And we, we really encourage that kind of investment because it's, it's their voice of bringing those application knowledge to it that really makes it kind of a triumvirate of hardware, software, and application. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to have one last question here because I did see some questions come through to the panelists on, on the chat, and I want to get to a couple of those. So uh, my last question is really, you know, why do we believe Chicago and Illinois will become the leader in quantum research? And uh, I'm going to start with Andy. Andy, please. Well, First of all, I was born and raised uh, in the Midwest, and, and I grew up most of my uh, uh, life in, in the Chicago suburb before uh, heading out east and spending some time where Vanessa uh, got her PhD. Um, but, you know, Illinois in general, Chicago in particular, with its world class universities, the researchers, the laboratory facilities, and I will say the friendliest people on the planet, at least my mom says so, and I agree. Uh, Chicago as a, re as a region really has become one of the leading global hubs for quantum research. The investments from U of I, from U of, uh, University of Chicago, the facilities of uh, you know, two of the US Department of Energy National Labs and the combined intellectual talent in our ecosystem really make Chicago a great destination uh, for quantum in particular. Um, and under all of this is a strong commitment from the state of Illinois really stepping forward you know, to, to uh, to make a stake in, in quantum in, uh, in Chicago and in Illinois to accelerate regional leadership in, in quantum technologies. That is a wonderful commitment from the state. Thanks for raising that, Andy. Uh, Brad, what are your thoughts to add to this as well? It, to me, the theme of the conversation generally is 
in order to bring quantum technology to market, you need lots of different stakeholders to collaborate closely. Uh, and so what I get re really excited about our region is we have all of those components, right? We have a trillion dollars in corporate revenue from very forward thinking companies. We have two of the best national labs in the country. We have the DOE pushing us to be more forward thinking in the way that we do this. We have incredible research universities. We have great start, you, know, you sort of name all the pieces. And so step one in that process of collaboration is having the pieces. Step two is actually making those pieces work together effectively. And I just think we've started to develop that playbook. Um, I think that the past 24 months in this technology in particular, um, with the leadership of a lot of the folks that are on the call here today, we've taken those steps forward. Now we, much like the Bears haven't won in the Super Bowl in a while, um, we've not won the, the quantum Super Bowl yet, right? We, there's no, there are no victories to declare at this point, um, but I think we're learning as a team what it's gonna take to do this. And so I'm uh, optimistic that we can pull it off. I am too, I see a win in our future. And I'm gonna ask Jay to close us out here on this question. Jay, please. Sure, you know, we've talked about uh, various aspects here and let me go back to the university piece again. Uh, we've talked about research at universities, but I wanna talk about the educational mission of universities. And we talked about workforce. And at the end of the day, it's these universities and the experience, not only our students will get at all of our world-class universities in the region, but with the companies that are that we hope to attract here, the companies we tend to create here, that they'll get that experiential learning. And I think the, the really important thing, um, and there's data to support this, not to get into that now, but the more diverse you have of a workforce in starting these startups, the exits can be higher. Um, we've seen that data um, probably over the last 20 years. And I think that diversity and inclusion piece we've talked about, we're located on the south side of Chicago. And I think um, we embody that. And I think that's really important to this effort as well of workforce. Terrific. Thank you, Jay. Okay, I'm going to move over to some of our audience questions. Um, we did have a question just about how to find out more information about duality. So I did want to let everyone know, uh, as of to, today, uh, dualityaccelerator.com, uh, you can find more information out there. Uh, let me move over to, uh, we had a question come in from Chad Evans at the Council on Competitiveness. Thank you, Chad, for your question. And it's really about duality success. What does it look like in the next few years and what will matter most to our success? Um, let me, uh, Jay, if I can you on this question. You know, I, I can start it out in, and uh, Chad, thanks for the question. I, I participate in some of Chad's um, activities and it's, it's great to see a question from you, Chad. Um, because I shouldn't really be the one answering this question, other than to tell you there are things that we know, uh, amongst other things, that can indicate success. We know the number of dollars that companies can raise can be an indication of success. We know exits can be an indication of success. We know that um, their offerings to the market, uh, the number of customers they have, um, are all great indicators. But I'm inside, so I'd like to um, inside of this whole thing, but I'd like an, another panelist or so to kind of give their perspective as well. Yeah, I, I could jump in on that one. Uh, having been part of University of Chicago's New Venture Challenge for years, one thing that makes it so special is that the companies that come out of that are real companies. They're viable. They turn into real businesses. It's, it's cross-functional teams that uh, involve both uh, members from in, outside of the universities combined with uh, members within the universities and, and even in many cases, the research labs around it. So I think the biggest measure of success is, are we producing real companies who are doing real imp impactful things? And, and over the next five years, exit might be a bad measure per se, but the amount of money raised will be a very good measure. If they're real companies and they're raising real money, they're on a path to making a big difference. Thanks, Dan. Other thoughts from the panelists? I think one, one measure of success of, of duality as an accelerator is really how it impacts the ecosystem as well, right? It's, it's not just enough to see um, some companies build and grow, but if they all build and grow elsewhere, 
um, then some of the mission of, of building a viable ecosystem that really has critical mass would be lost. So, so you know, I agree with Dan that we want to see viable companies and we want to see growth, but we also want to see uh, a growing momentum in this ecosystem and see companies uh, help to propel things forward and, and make good on the investments of the universities and the state. One other thing, Megan, I wanted to add on this one is, you know, we can't forget the role of big private strategic companies uh, because I think success is also the ability for those startups to be working closely with those uh, companies so that we see joint development agreements and things like that so that we are getting traction and pull from the strategics that actually are using the technology. And so I think it's not even just like revenues, but is there any you know, kind of joint development happening with some of the bigger strategic players that have the ecosystem and the infrastructure to actually bring some of this stuff to market? And that would be another measure for, for me. Thank you, Vanessa. Any other thoughts? Okay, I'm gonna go back to the, supp the supply chain topic. Um, we had a question come in really about wondering you know what's happening in the community around helping the startups um, through sharing of software and hardware right for the benefit of all so people aren't reinventing the wheel or doing re reworking things in silos so wanted to open it up to the panel to get your thoughts on this what you're seeing already uh, in the market and and what you think are uh, needed next steps in terms of the supply chain Uh, I'll jump in. I mean, one thing that helped the ecosystem uh, around the last 20 years has been some of the cloud-based platforms opening up their clouds to startups uh, to help them get started with very low barriers to entry. And I think we have a similar opportunity to do that with quantum companies, both on the computing side. Can we open up the early quantum computers to the accelerators and incubators so that the early stage companies have a platform? And as I mentioned earlier, it's not just computing. There's also design platforms. We call ours Albert that help in the sensing area. And even uh, some of the, the hardware components. So those who wanna build a, a quantum, uh, physical quantum system, they need some key components. And can we make some of those available uh, to the startups in ways that lower their barrier entries and, and accelerate their time to market? And I'd like to build on what Dan said, if I could. And I saw a question or a comment come up regarding this. I don't know that we have the answer to this yet, but we know that it's possible some elements of open source will play into this as well um, relative to the supply chain. So I think that'll be really an interesting question for us is what becomes open source, what isn't, um, what will enable this ecosystem and the industry to grow faster? I think those are some strategic questions yet to be answered. Thanks, Jay. Any other thoughts on this question? I'd like to add that um, yeah, two things. One is uh, open source software we think is very beneficial. One of the things that we did for our, the interface of our system to the world is to have, uh, you know, we leveraged what IBM had developed for OpenCASM, the circuit description language that made it very accessible to all software platforms and, and a good interface there. And then from the hardware side of things, uh, open source hardware is <laughs> interesting, but the idea of access, I think, is the heart of it. And there's currently an effort right now amongst all the hardware providers called the Quest program to get government funding to be able to provide access to systems and do it in a way that it's not traditional quantum users, that maybe there's a biologist somewhere who says, what if I applied quantum to this kind of problem? This would provide them a path to getting uh, that access and having that funded. Thanks, Justin. Good to know. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, I'm gonna jump to another question here. We've got a few folks um, from, you know, attending here today from other parts outside of the Chicago area, one in particular in Michigan. And so we've got some interest to know how does this accelerator and the resources of the accelerator extend beyond the Chicagoland region? And, you know, how, how do we see it interacting with the world? So, uh, Jay, can I ask you to kick this one off? Sure. I mean, uh, just to make a point, the accelerator is absolutely open to uh, initially to any company uh, in the U.S. And Michigan's part of the U.S. So definitely, if you're in Michigan, you're more than welcome. I mean, that's how we look at um, right now as we launch this 
as we launch Duality, um, we want to have a broad reach. We want to attract um, people to work with us. Um, and we know given the state of things in the world today, it may be initially virtually. And so there's a lot of opportunity there. Absolutely. Megan, I would just add very briefly that um, mm -hmm. developing this technology and making it good for the world is gonna take lots of regions succeeding. Uh, and so there, there, you know, there's, um, we're, we're gonna need Colorado to succeed and, and, and the, the Boston to succeed, et cetera, to be part of, part of this process. I think the part that, that we think about is, the good news is our region is organized. Our region is organized. And so what that really allows us to do is if there's a great partner in Michigan or a partner in Pennsylvania or wherever, uh, their ability to then link in with us and get the very best of our region uh, is so much easier. The friction costs are so much lower, et cetera. And so I, I just think uh, this is an example of an area where regardless of where you are in the country right now, reach out to any of us uh, deeply involved with quantum uh, in the Chicagoland region in Illinois. And we're gonna work really hard to get connected to the right people because we've been at this for a while and it matters a lot to us. And I just wanna to add to this, which is, you know, uh, Argo National Labs is one of 17 national labs. And, uh, you know, we really are connected as a national uh, lab system. And so where I see is like, you know, Chicago and Argonne are like a portal, right? To the rest of the nation around things that can be happening. Uh, those of you on the call who are obviously uh, science, uh, scientific people, so it's, it's like the Borg, right? I can use this, this analogy, right? So you activate one part, you got the rest of it, right? But we're doing Borg for good, right? But that's kind of the idea is, I think it's, you know, Chicago plus, uh, with Chicago being a key portal to come into things. And so um, every single time I've seen these kinds of things, if it's just focused on one and it's not looking at the whole, uh, you have uh, less power. And so I'm really excited to see this as a catalyst towards greater things that can happen across the nation. Expanding our impact, expanding the impact, Vanessa. Uh, somebody else was trying to jump in there, please. Yeah, I was just gonna pile on a little bit in that uh, we have an opportunity to create an industry here. And I think collaborating across regions is key to that. So it's not about a rivalry between one area and another. It's about how do we create an opportunity set that's significant, uh, certainly here in the US, but really uh, globally as well. This is a gigantic opportunity and there's room for all of us to contribute toward it. And, and Dan, uh, I'm so glad you made that point. Um, even though we've been talking a lot about Chicago today, you can look at the life science industry or even the semiconductor computing industries prior to this, they've all relied on multiple innovation centers that all work together. And there's no reason not to believe that's going to need to be the case here. Thank you. And with that, I think we will conclude our panel. I would like to thank all the panelists. Um, to the audience, again, you can get more information at dualityaccelerator.com. Um, it really is an exciting time right now to unlock the quantum economy. So thank you all. And I'm going to turn it back over to Juan de Pablo. Juan, please. Thank you, Megan. And again, thank you to our panelists and the uh, audience for your questions and participating in this announcement. Good to see everyone. Stay safe. <laughs>